Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I've, I've not been here in such a long time. It's lovely to be back. So welcome to this service of worship. And to anyone who might be watching later on YouTube, welcome to you as well. Thank you for joining us. The call to worship is one of the Psalms. Just waiting for my Kindle to wake up. It's there. <laughs> From Psalm 84, we've been focusing quite a lot over the last few months about how we're still the church, even though many of us have had to worship from home. But this psalm is very definitely about worshipping together. It's about worshipping in the temple. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and a longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young by the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. And I just love that image of the birds making their nests actually inside the temple next to the altar of God. Let's sing our first hymn, which is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. to worship with all our heart and mind and strength. This is your day, the day to remember your energy in creation and the earth that constantly reshapes and renews itself. 
This is your day to proclaim good news that Jesus is alive. And a day to celebrate your spirit poured into the followers of Jesus. We ask you to review us. Help us to delight in your creative energy and rejoice in your new life. We worship and we praise you. A prayer of confession. Let's look back over the days of the past week. And let's remember the people we met, knew and familiar, the places we went to, and the way we spent our time. During the week, some opportunities were lost, and some we missed. Some difficulties we faced, and some we avoided. There were people we were happy to see and we got on with, and those we gave up on. Lord, we are sorry for the ways in which we have failed, and we ask forgiveness. We give thanks for everything that's good in our lives, and we ask you to guide us for the future. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So we have our gospel reading now, which is quite a short passage from John's Gospel, chapter 6. The second is a little picture, chapter six, verses three to six, which is the account of page chapter one, thousand and eleven of the disciples who went to him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living father said to me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds for me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds from this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Japan. But hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Thank you. So with that reading about Jesus saying something that was quite hard and difficult. The idea that his followers should eat his flesh and drink his blood. And if we heard that for the first time, it, it would sound horrible, wouldn't it? We wouldn't like that. Of course, afterwards, it was seen as a symbol of Holy Communion, of the bread and the wine, representing the body and the blood of Jesus. And very ordinary things. And so I have those symbols here. 
some ordinary bread and an ordinary drink. In their culture, it was bread and it was wine. Perhaps for us, it might be juice, as I have here. It might be a cup of tea. But those symbols of ordinary food and an ordinary meal where people just come together and would share their faith in Jesus, what they felt and what they believed and what they remembered. And in those ordinary things, we could think perhaps of how food and drink are essential to our lives. We could think of what they do for us. They help us to grow, they give us energy, help us repair wounds, fight infections. And a meal brings people together, doesn't it? Perhaps all of us will experience getting together with friends, with family, and sharing that fellowship. And those ordinary things become symbols of what's extraordinary. That Jesus is with us when we share those symbols of bread and wine. And remind us that God is at work in us. And in at, at work in us individually and together when we share that fellowship. So here are the symbols, some bread, and a drink. And reminding us that when we get together over Holy Communion, what we're saying is, I want Jesus to be a part of me, as integral a part of me as the food that goes into my body and becomes part of me. And that I want Jesus to renew me as my food and drink renews me. So our next hymn is going to use that symbol and I wonder if now David doesn't know this one so are we going to be okay? <laughs> I, I think reading, which is from the book of 1 Kings. Our second reading is taken from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 8, verse 1, then we continue from 6 to 11, 20 to 30, and 41 to 40 is found on page 330 of the Bible. 
Israelites. Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite families to bring up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Zion, the city of David. Continue from verse 6 to 11. The priest then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark and overshadowed the ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place. And they are still there today. There, was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. When the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priest could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple from verses 22 to 30. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands towards heaven and said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven, above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth, you have promised, and with your hand, you have fulfilled it as it is today. Now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, you shall never fail to have extra success to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all they do, to walk before me faithfully as they have done. And now, God of Israel, let your word that you have promised your servant David, my father, come true. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much more, how much less this temple I have built. Yet, Give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open towards this temple night and day, this place of which you have said, my name shall be there so that you shall hear the prayer your servant prays towards this place. Hear the supplication of your servants and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. We will finish with verses 41 to 43. As for the foreigners who do not belong to your people, as for the foreigners who do not belong to your people Israel, but have come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when they come and pray towards this temple. Then hear from heaven, your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigners ask of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people, Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. Amen. Thank you. Well, that was one of the golden moments in Jewish history, the day of the dedication of their first temple. And they were so proud of that temple. It was so beautiful and such an achievement that King David had started collecting the materials 
and his son Solomon was the one who actually got to see the project through and saw that day of dedication. So that was part of his speech and his prayer. Well, let's think for a moment about the golden age. I wonder if anyone would like to say what golden age they're thinking of. Maybe we have some different ones in mind. If I say think of a, a golden time or a golden moment. I've put everyone on the spot. So what are you thinking? <laughs> When your children were born, that is a wonderful time of life, isn't it? Having young children in the house. I'm getting to relive that now with my grandchildren in the house. It's, it's lovely. If I were to say the golden age of music, for me, that's the 70s and the Bay City Rollers. Does anyone want to disagree with that? <laughs> Irene, what, what's the golden age of music? <laughs> yeah. The classics, Beethoven and Tchaikovsky, a, a classical fan. Okay. The eighties. Now I'm a bit hazy about the eighties. Which, which groups are you thinking of? <laughs> Duran Duran and Bronsky beat. Okay. I have heard of them. So the golden moments are perhaps different for all of us, but perhaps some of those life events are the ones that stand out getting married, having children, passing those important exams, those, those achievements. So from that golden moment in history of the dedication of the temple, I want to draw your attention to one of the obscure verses in that chapter. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse, verse 8 and it's talking about the Ark of the Covenant, which had been carried around in the wilderness. And on this day of dedication, it was carried in great ceremony into its place in the Holy of Holies. So here it is. And we heard a bit about the, the, the cherubim, uh, like statues on the Ark with their wings outstretched and almost but not quite meeting in the middle. And then verse eight, the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. Okay, so the poles, the poles are still there, says the writer. So what time are we talking about to this day when the writer is thinking back to this time, writing it all down, and he knows that the poles are still there. It can be quite helpful with many books of the Bible to think not just about the events described, but also about the time of writing and what might have been in the writer's mind and why it was written and why it was written like this. So why is he picking out this little detail about the poles? Well, to get a very, very, very rough date of the writing of the book, we only have to look at the end of it. At the end of Two Kings and see what was happening there. Now here we have a different story. There's a story about the last king of Israel who reigned, sorry, Judah, Zedekiah. And he's being captured and his sons are being killed in front of him. And then Zedekiah being blinded by the Babylonians. His brother who should have been king, taken away into exile and at first kept in prison, but then released and, and treated a bit more nicely in Babylon. And the temple is in a bit of a sad state. It's been looted and broken down. The bronze pillars that were there have gone. The Babylonians have also taken away the pots, shovels, the snuffers, 
the incense dishes, all the bronze vessels, all the gold and silver. But the writer tells us the poles are still there. So he's looking back at that golden moment of dedication and how beautiful and rich that temple was from the time when it was very different. The writer did use sources and he named some of them here and there. 1 Kings 11.41 says that he used the book of the Acts of Solomon. In another place, he says he uses the book of the annals of the king of Judah. One reason the Bible is so powerful to us is that so much of it wasn't written from the mountaintops. It wasn't written from when everything was successful and lovely and going well and according to plan. It was written from the low points. It was written from the valley of the shadow of death. So this person writing this history looking back at the golden moments, but knowing that now everything's in ruins, everything's destroyed. How can you write about those high points of the past? I suppose one way to do it is with a lot of nostalgia and pile on the if onlys. If only we still had a king like David. If only we still had Solomon. If only our most recent kings hadn't been so useless. So they could be the grumpy old people, remembering how things used to be and moaning about the youth of today who don't know they're born. Or they can look forward. And this is what this writer seems to do. I'm going to re read a bit from the book of Jeremiah and there's quite a popular theory amongst the scholars that it, it was Jeremiah who wrote the earlier history. That it could, be, it could well be Jeremiah who was the final editor of the books from Deuteronomy to Two Kings. They're quite similar in outlook um, to the, the main book of Jeremiah, or at least with possibly written by his friend Baruch the scribe. So here's Jeremiah writing to the people in exile and his advice to them from Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage and seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For thus says the Lord of hosts, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you. I did not send them says the Lord. Now, all too often, the Jews are kind of set up as a cipher for bad religion. And then we compare ourselves and say how lovely Christians are by comparison. And there are times when the Bible doesn't present people as perfect. It presents people as they are quite realistically. And there are times of nationalism and legalism in a warts and all picture, if you like. But let's go back a bit to Solomon's prayer in the temple. So 1 Kings 8, 42 to 43. When the foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land, and, and remember the writer has seen those foreigners come, and what they've done to their land. When the foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, 
for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays towards this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to what the foreigner calls to you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel. Solomon prays about the future when the foreigner has come. We could ask the question, was this really Solomon's prayer? Or were they the words of the editor who is thinking and praying over his writing and thinking, what would Solomon say to this generation? Well, whichever way it was, he's not looking forward to a time of revenge and defeating the enemies. He's looking forward to the foreigner coming to know the Lord. He's looking forward to reconciliation. We can follow that thread through to Jesus saying, bless your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's hard stuff, isn't it? Isn't that difficult to take on board that somebody actually in Jerusalem and seeing those poles, back to that obscure detail, seeing those poles in the temple that are still there. But what else is he looking at? What else is still there? Possibly not very much because the temple had been looted and set fire to and left in ruins. How hard to be thinking of reconciliation and praying for those foreigners who've come and done this to know the Lord. There are times when life is just hard, aren't there? And having faith is hard. We can be stretched and tested to the limit. It's hard for people in Afghanistan at the moment, in Syria. It's hard for refugees and people who are, don't know if they will become refugees tomorrow. And what can faith offer? Faith can help us to see what our eyes and our minds can't always take in, that there is a future and it's God who's in charge of it. So a, just a tiny little detail back in Jeremiah and that letter to the exiles, Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are complete will I visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. 70 years, that's such a long time, isn't it? How many of us would be here if we were promised something in 70 years time? How many of us would see it? Not many. Perhaps our children, perhaps not even then, perhaps not even our children, our grandchildren would be the ones who'd see the fulfillment of the promise. But he goes on, for surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare, not for harm, to give you a future and a hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. And when you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. You might know about those words that were found scratched into the wall of a concentration camp. I believe in the sun, even when I don't see it shining. I believe in love, even when there's no one there. And I believe in God, even when he is silent. So we remember the past and we're thankful for it. And we're thankful for those golden moments that we can look back on. And we trust God for the future. Amen.
Our next hymn is Longing for Light, We Wait in Darkness. Um, I'm right. looking hopefully at you, Joe. Yes. <laughs> Shall we pray? Lord God, indeed there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. We thank you for the love you show us, your guidance and protection over our lives and for the gift of a new day like this. We pray for all Christians around the world that we may go out in love and in confidence 
in the knowledge that you are with us every step of the way. We lift our brothers and sisters in Mexico who've just suffered a hurricane over the weekend. For Haiti, who's suffering from the consequences of natural disaster. Look upon them, Lord, with your compassion. Heal the injured. Comfort those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We also bring before you our concern for the people of Afghanistan, living in fear due to the takeover by the Taliban. May your perfect love that cast out all fears take control of the situation and calm the storm. May the rest of the world not look on unconcerned, but support with every kindness and help resettle those who have ended up as refugees in foreign lands. We lift the work of the Methodist Church into your care, Lord, and especially for the ministers in our circuit. Align their hearts and mind to yours, Lord, that they may always put your work first and serve you in humility. For our church family, we pray that you shall renew our minds, teach us to love and encourage one another and work together in unity to bring more people to know you. Lord, you are able to do exceedingly above what we can ever imagine. May your healing power touch the sick amongst us. We lift before you especially Anne Molly, who starts treatment tomorrow. We pray, Father Lord, that she shall receive the right treatment and she shall be healed in the name of Jesus. We also pray for Mrs. Atkinson, for Fiona, for Beryl, for Bill and Mary. Be their source of strength, Lord, and nourishment. You are a faithful God. And we are grateful that you know each of us by name. Thank you for answering our prayers in your perfect timing. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Our final hymn then, number 470 in singing the faith. Be a little bit louder, I think. 